thank you for being here this morning at First Baptist Church. If you have your Bibles, I would turn to Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 10. Two different places, Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 10. I appreciate you taking time to be here. Those who are visiting, a special welcome to you this morning as well. And I hope your heart's been encouraged this morning. I know mine has, just to again reflect upon the incredible gift that Jesus Christ has given to us. His sacrifice, his love that was displayed. Our theme this year is rooted in him. What is our theme this year? Rooted in, in him. It's on the side walls. It's not behind us right now. But uh, rooted in him, rooted in Jesus Christ. My prayer this year is at the end of 2023 that every single uh, person who's a part of First Baptist Church, whether you're a member, whether you're a visitor, whether you're a guest, whether you're one and done, whatever it may be, whatever part you play at First Baptist Church, that at the end of the year, you will be closer to Jesus Christ. Right? If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I pray that today you trust him as your Savior. That gift of God was shown through the love of Jesus Christ. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All the songs this morning reminded us of that tremendous and powerful and sacrificial gift of love. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, I pray that today you trust Jesus Christ. But if you have trusted Jesus Christ, I pray that today you draw closer to Jesus Christ. We're not here as a social gathering, though we're going to have some friends here at First Baptist Church. We're not here just to drink coffee and have donuts, though we do that in the morning as well. We're here for one reason alone, and that is to worship Jesus. As you worship him, I pray your hearts would go closer to him. In this context, in this frame, the next few weeks I'll be preaching a kind of an overview of the gospel of Mark. We've looked through Matthew, now we'll look to Mark, and just so you know, after we get done with Mark, we're going to go to Luke next and then to John, just so you know. Just, there's no surprises here at First Baptist Church. But the gospel of Mark is, is the shortest gospel of the four gospels. Just a few chapters long. It's a different uh, different tone than the other Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all somewhat similar with John being the outlier, and, and each has its own unique take on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. The Gospel meaning the good news of Jesus Christ. That tells me a couple things. That tells me that in the book of Mark, I'm going to find some good news. Maybe you're not excited about this. I'm excited. In the Gospel of Mark, we're going to find some good news. This is why it's exciting. Do, don't do this now, but if you have your phone later on, go to, go to whatever news is your poison. And you will not find good news. You will find bad news. And the badder the news is, the more they want to hook you to stay. But the closer I get to Jesus, the gooder the news I find. You're like, Pastor, you need a lesson in English. I need more than that in life. I tell you that right now. <laughs> in the gospel of Mark, we're going to find some good news. It's good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel means good news. But it's also about Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John specifically speak to a point about our Savior, Jesus Christ. Each gospel with a slightly different emphasis. The gospel of Matthew, we looked at that I believe the point of Matthew was to show Jesus Christ as the king not only of the Jews, but of the entire universe. The gospel of Mark we're going to come to, and you'll see it on your, on your screen, that the point of the gospel of Mark is Jesus, the supreme servant. Now, some would offer this take instead. They'd say, well, no, no, no. Mark presents Jesus as the humble servant. But aren't humble servant, aren't they kind of like, don't they kind of like go hand in hand? Was not Jesus Christ, is he not the supreme servant? We'll find in the Bible that Jesus Christ was the servant of servants. He is the example of servants. Jesus Christ is the supreme servant. This morning, as I direct your attention, we'll kind of do a little bit of background and then we'll, we'll begin this concept. But I want you to turn to Mark chapter 1. Each gospel a little bit different. And Mark was not, Mark was not one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. Matthew was. In fact, in the series of messages on Matthew, we looked at the call of Matthew. He was sitting at his table as a tax collector, and Jesus called him to follow him, and Matthew followed Jesus. Mark was not called a 12, as a 12, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. Though, if we look in Scripture, one of, the, one of the services we'll preach, one of the messages I'll preach is on 
Mark specifically, and I believe he was alive when Jesus was there. In fact, he's even mentioned in the book of Mark. But he's not one of the 12. When we get there, we'll find out that Mark heard most of his, most of his things he heard from the apostle that's not well known. His first name is um, Peter. Remember Peter in Scripture? Oh, Peter. Peter was brash. Peter would speak before he thought. Jesus says, you're going you're gonna, to uh, deny me. And, and Peter says, though everyone, though the whole universe denies you, Jesus, I won't deny you. It's me and you, Jesus. Jesus says, Peter, you will deny me three times. Peter, who's brash, who often spoke before thinking. Peter is the one that largely influenced Mark, and we find that in the New Testament. We'll look there in a couple of weeks, we look at the story of Mark, the individual of Mark. But when we come to the Gospel of Mark, we find kind of a, a different approach than the other Gospels. Matthew is extremely systematic as he presents Jesus Christ as king. Very carefully supports this from the very early uh, dialogues and the pages where he says Jesus was born king of the Jews, though not born in Jerusalem. We see systematically Matthew proving that Jesus is the king of the Jews and of the whole world and the universe. Luke. Luke is very uh, uh, thought-provoking. Luke takes his time and lays out things that no other gospel lays out. Luke was a physician. He'll bring details to the parables that we don't find anywhere else but Mark. Mark is like a machine gun. Mark, once you begin, you have to hold on to your seat and buckle the seatbelt because Mark just attacks this concept of Jesus Christ and from the first words to the last words, he just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. I want to show that from Mark chapter 1. If your Bibles are looking at Mark chapter 1, where he begins, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John did baptize in the wilderness. In verse number 4, we have, through verse number 9, we have the testifying of John the Baptist. Verse number 10, in Mark chapter 1, you find the baptism of Jesus Christ. In verse number 11, the voice of God. Verse number 12, you find the temptation of Jesus Christ. Now at this point, if you're in Matthew, this would be Matthew chapter 4. Mark does it in 11 verses. Matthew takes chapter number 4 and spends maybe 15, 12 to 15 verses on the temptation of Jesus Christ. Uh, John spends verse, I'm sorry, Mark spends verse 11, 12, and 13. And he's done with that. Verse number 14 We now have John in prison and Jesus preaching. His ministry has begun. There's no no beginning miracle of of the water turned to wine. No, Jesus is is already in the ministry right at this point. He's going in verse number 14 and he's preaching. In verse number 15, he is calling the disciples. 15 through verse number 20. But verse number 21, he's casting out demons. And verse number 28 through 28, he casts and he teaches and he interacts with people. In verse number 29, he's healing in the synagogue, in verse number 30, he's healing Simon Peter's, uh, 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 Peter's mother-in-law. In verse 35 to 38, he's out, he's, out pre- he's out praying. In verse number 39, he's preaching again. In verse number 40, he's healing lepers. In verse 45, he's in the desert and everyone's coming to him. And my friends, that's just chapter 1. Mark is a machine gun. He's going to attack the ministry of Jesus Christ and lay it out in such a way to present to us this concept that Jesus Christ is the supreme servant. As you read the book of Mark, I would encourage you over the next few weeks to take some time to read the book of Mark. You will find that Jesus in this particular gospel is always doing. He's always serving. He is continually giving himself and expending himself, and being spent for the ministry, for the gospel, about his father's business, doing that work. Mark presents to us that Jesus Christ is the supreme servant. This morning I want to challenge us 
with two questions. With two questions. The first question will be, so if Jesus Christ is a servant, how has he served me? What has he done for us? And the second question, if Jesus Christ is a supreme servant, then how should I serve? And we find these answers, if you would take your Bibles, to Mark, in Mark, to Mark chapter 10. We find the answers to these two questions in Mark chapter 10, where I find what I would say is probably the central thought of the gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 35 to verse 45, we have a section of scripture that Mark spends some time on. Now remember, in chapter 1, you can barely catch your breath on what Mark is saying, and here he takes 10 verses to talk about one interaction, showing that this was incredibly important to the point of the book of Mark. Incredibly influential in his heart, in his life, in his ministry, and now in this application. I want to direct our attention to Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 45 this morning and draw some principles out, answer these two questions. Verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Now we're going to pause these reading. I'm going to pause there real quick. Jesus is God. Never to be fooled. Never to be manipulated. And he wasn't under any, under any threat here. But I read this, and I don't know about you, but when I read the scripture, sometimes my mind will, will jump off, off the rails for a second and put myself there. And, and have, I, have I ever seen this thought before? And, and I have seen this before. I have children. Dad, will you say yes to something I'm about to ask you? And only the fool agrees. Not only do I have children, I've taught in our school. I've been principal. Pastor J.D., would you say yes to a question we're about to ask you? And only a fool would say yes without hearing the question. Not only do I have children, not only have I been a principal, but I also have employees here at First Baptist Church. Pastor Howell, just say yes. What's the question? Don't worry yourself with the question. And only a fool. And here, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to Jesus Christ, the master, and say, Jesus, would you just say yes to our question? And Jesus presents an incredible answer to us. Always knowing what to say and how to say it. Driving right to the heart of the issue. Right to the heart of the matter. Str striking aside the, the things that could be distracting. And Jesus now says in verse 36, he said to them, What would ye that I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. Now there is some discussion about where this is going to be, whether it's in his earthly kingdom or heavenly kingdom. At times the disciples were confused. Remember, even in the resurrection, they didn't believe at first. So there was some discussion. There's some discussion. Is this the heavenly kingdom? Is this the earthly kingdom? I think there's a great answer. It doesn't matter. It's a terrible question. It is a self-serving question. It is a self-centered question. It is in complete opposition to the point of Mark showcasing Jesus Christ as a supreme servant. And these two disciples, James and John, somehow got in their mind, we have a great idea. Now, you ever had an idea that when you actually, like, flushed it out, it wasn't as good as you thought it was? That's this idea right here. Were they sitting there? Because, remember, another pastor will tell us that the disciples were unhappy with James and John. Were they sitting there like, hey, we got a great idea. Hey, James, John, you and me, we'll, we'll rule with Jesus. And if we ask first, no one else can rule. 
Like, where did they think this was going to go? Where did they think this was going to end up? Where did they think that this was going to be a good thing? And so they asked Jesus Christ, can we sit with you in thy glory and rule, one on your right hand and one on your left hand? Can we rule with you, whether supernaturally, whether earthly kingdom, either way, they wanted to be right next to Jesus and not equal with him, but just right underneath him. Lord, you can still be in charge. We'll just be the next in charge. Verse 38 of Mark chapter 10, Jesus answers. You know not what she ask. I think he mentions that specifically to say, listen, boys, you have no idea. You have no idea what you're doing, what you're asking for. James and John, you have no concept of how I'm going to suffer and what I'm going to face. You have no idea the opposition that I will face. You have no concept of the demonic forces that are against me and, and what this is going on. James and John, you don't know what you're asking for. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, we can. <laughs> Jesus is so, is so patient. He said to them in verse 39, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it should be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Why do you think they were displeased? Were they displeased because... Was it because James and John overstepped or was it because they didn't think about it first? We're humans. We've been there before. And usually our irritation is not for the righteous, the righteous indignation. It's selfish irritation. I, well, we act righteous. Oh, I can't believe that James would ask that. No, Lord, I'll sit wherever you want me to sit. No, 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 no. They were much displeased, but for selfish reasons. So Jesus now teaches us. Look, please, in verse 42. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. And here it is. And if you highlight in your Bible or underline your Bible, I encourage you to underline this verse. Put a note here. Here is the point, I believe, of the Gospel of Mark. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's ask the Lord's help in the service this morning. Lord, I ask you for your help today. Lord, I pray you'd help us in the next few moments as we quickly look at this passage. Lord, I just ask for you to guide us. Lord, you're the model of a servant. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be pricked this morning, that we would showcase your love through our love. Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that you would work in their heart today. Show them their need for salvation, and may they respond to your gift. Lord, bless this time. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ. As a supreme servant. There's two different words in the New Testament that we find servant used as. This one here, you see in your, in your Bible, you'll see servant or minister. The idea of this word gives us the concept of someone who waits on someone else or a waiter or a waitress. We see this regularly. You go out to eat and you can go to your Applebee's or to your Outback Steakhouse, wherever your poison of choice may be, and you have a waiter or a waitress. And they come to your table and they serve you. Sometimes they do it well and sometimes they do it poorly. Sometimes they're very attentive and sometimes they're not. Sometimes you walk away and you're like, that was a really good experience. And other times you think... I'm never going back to this place because the service was terrible. Sometimes it's their fault. Sometimes it's not. 
We've had experiences with waiters and waitresses. I'm reminded when I was working on the sermon of a time I was with my wife. It was the oh, first time I'd been out to New Jersey and took her and her sister to a, to a nice seafood restaurant. Her and her sister loved seafood, and we got these lobster pots. They were about $90 a pot. I think we got nine of them. If you've seen my wife eat seafood, then you understand that story. When I, whenever I eat at a restaurant, I get incredibly thirsty. I drink before I come to preach, right? Not up here, I can't, but up there, I'll, I'll drink a bottle, sometimes a bottle and a half of water. At a restaurant, I am like throwing it down. My wife says that I'm a camel. In fact, she says to the, usually the waiter or waitress, she goes, just bring more. My husband will, will like empty the glass over and over again. All right, now, I don't care if you think it's good to drink water or not while you eat, right? I'm just telling you what I do. Seafood is particularly salty. This particular evening, I was eating seafood, and I was dying of thirst. I would have sold my birthright for a cup, for a drop of water. So here I am. I'm not having the best of attitudes because our waitress that night was less than attentive in my glass of water. There I was at one point looking at my, my girlfriend at that point and her twin sister and saying along the lines of, what does the guy have to do to get a drink around here? And my wife having that that time, the girlfriend that, that looked at, I've come to realize what it looks like now, that shock look that says, she's right behind you. And there she was right over my, my, my shoulder right there. And uh, so not only did I get more water, but it cost me a lot for the tip that night. A lot for the tip that night. We've had waiters and waitresses. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ came not to be waited on, but to wait on. And he challenges his disciples not only to, to observe, but to listen and to follow. I want to give us this morning three principles from this passage that I believe will help us answer these questions. One, has Jesus served me? And two, how do I serve? How should I serve? Number one, as we look at this, at this passage, I want us to understand this concept all right, look in verse 42. Ye know that they which are counted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. The first principle that I want you to understand is we must guard. We must guard against magnifying our own importance. If we're going to be a servant, we're not to magnify ourselves, but to magnify the supreme servant. Just to help us, I have a magnifying glass. Now, these things are helpful, are they not? They take things that are small and make them appear to be larger than they are. Sometimes, as people age, they will use a magnifying glass to see words that they could not see before. The words are not bigger. Help me, they just appear to be bigger. That's what a magnifying glass does. You know what happens when we magnify ourselves? We don't become bigger. We just appear to be bigger than we are. Now, the, the crazy thing about magnifying glasses, I don't know if you can see this, they can like, I don't know if you can see my eye at all. Can you see my eye? Yes, no? Shake them and rattle them. Can, can you see it? Yes or no? When I do that, does it not like kind of like strangely distort my eye a little bit and like, like that's kind of weird, right? Maybe you've seen someone in the, in the old days, they'd wear like one of those monocles on their eyes and you'd see their eyes like, ooh, that looks kind of funny. Because anytime we magnify something that should not be bigger, it appears and it is distorted a little bit. You know what happens in our life as well? It's not just about a, a piece of glass. It happens, it happens when we try to magnify ourselves. When we try to exalt ourselves. This is what Jesus is talking about. He said, listen, if you're going to be the example of the servant, the supreme servant, and follow me, you cannot be focused on magnifying yourself. Put the magnifying glass away. And Jesus says, listen here, the Gentiles, those who don't know Jesus, what he's saying here, he said, this is what they do. They put that big magnifier right on themselves and they say, look at me. 
I'm bigger than you are. I exercise my lordship, my authority over you. I'm better than you are. And Jesus says, but it shall not be named, not to be named among the followers of Jesus Christ. How do we magnify our importance? We do it in three different ways. We magnify our importance, first of all, when we exalt our own leadership. When we exalt our own leadership, we magnify our importance. This is what the disciples were doing. Lord, let me be as in, almost as important as you are, exalting themselves. Sometimes people do it at church. Sometimes they'll do it at the job place. Sometimes they do it in public. Let me go first. I don't need to stand in line. I want to cut the line. They, they exalt their own leadership, their own importance. I get the credit for this. I get to make all the decisions. I'm in charge here. Magnifying their own importance. We magnify our own importance not only when, when we exalt our own leadership, but when we elevate our own needs. Well, make sure you serve me first, then you can serve yourself. Make sure here that my needs are met, and then I can meet other people's needs. I don't care that anyone else may, be, may, have, may have a problem. You just make sure that my issues are taken care of. You see, we exalt our own and magnify our own importance when we push aside everyone else's issues. My friends, this creeps into the church. Creeps into the church. What have you done for me? They didn't say hi to me. They didn't call me. Not thinking, how can I meet someone else's needs? How can I make a phone call? How can I say hi? It's magnifying myself. And Jesus says, when you magnify yourself, you are not showcasing servant. See, Jesus shows us that we must guard against magnifying our own importance. But number two, Jesus teaches us the perfect attitude. Look, verse 43, please. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Jesus says this is the attitude that you need to seek to serve. That you need to be trying, actively trying to serve. Not seeking to have your own needs met, but to meet some needs. You know, it's interesting that even in our consumer society, we have gravitated and grabbed this thought from Jesus Christ. In fact, they say that the most successful businesses will seek to serve their customers. Well, isn't that funny? Kind of like the truth of Jesus Christ is always true no matter where it's applied. Kind of like Jesus Christ really knew what he was talking about. Chick-fil-A is famous for this. They'll answer almost every request with these two words, my pleasure. Want some chicken nuggets? My pleasure. Well, another sweet iced tea, my pleasure. Is it a place of the day? And their answer was, of course. In fact, someone said this about in a secular workforce, there are no traffic jams along the extra mile. And that wasn't a Christian who said that, but clearly referencing the word of God. You see, Jesus Christ teaches that the followers of Jesus are not supposed to interact with everyone like everyone else. We interact differently. He teaches us the perfect attitude. He says, if you want to be great, serve. Or he says this, aim lowly. Not low, but aim lowly. Now, we have the shears with us, and they're going to be speaking tonight in a split session, men and women, and tomorrow night they're doing outdoor night. They are both excellent marksmen. I want to ask which is better. Because I believe when I've asked before, they each say the other one's better. All right? We should test it here tonight. No, we won't. We will not test it. But they know about aiming. Me? I'm not a great marksman. But this point is not about being a great marksman with a rifle or with a bow or with a crossbow. It's about being the correct marksman as a follower of Jesus Christ. And where we're to aim, we're, we're to aim to be lowly. 
See, Jesus Christ teaches us the perfect, exa- uh, the perfect attitude. But number three, Jesus Christ showed us the perfect example. And that's what verse 40, uh, 45 says. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Don't you love the fact that Jesus Christ did not say, he did not say this, do as I say, not as I do. He didn't say that. He didn't say this would be good advice. He said, listen, this is the way you ought to live. This is the correct attitude. And just so you know, disciples, this is exactly what I'm doing for you and for the entire universe. He said, this is what I'm displaying. This is what I'm showcasing. The purpose of Jesus Christ was not to be cared for, but to care for. It was not to receive from, but to give to. It was not to be doted on, but to deliver many, to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is the example of the humble and the supreme servant. He did not sacrifice his deity. He did not sacrifice his importance in serving, but he demonstrated his humility and his power. When you and I serve, we do not lose something, we gain something. We don't lose our right and our importance, we gain, we gain the commendation of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul in Philippians says this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. Hath given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. My friends, being a servant does not make us lose anything. It makes us gain everything. Come back to those two questions I presented us with. What has Jesus Christ done for us? What has he done? He's taught us the right attitude. He showed us the right example. He provided salvation for all of mankind, willingly setting aside his glory, his importance, if I may. He became obedient unto the death of the cross. What has he done for me? He showcased his love for me. He suffered for me. He's done the same for you. Jesus Christ has done so much. So what should we do? Two answers. Number one, serve Jesus. Reminded again of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, help me if you know it, service. Serve Jesus. And number two, serve others. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, that lowly word, in lowliness of mind, humbleness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Close this morning, I want to ask you just a couple of questions. What would your home look like if every member of the home, of your home, was seeking to be lowly? Aim low. Nope, nope, Dad, give me the small piece and give my sister the biggest piece with the extra frosting. No, no, honey, please sit down. I'll do the dishes tonight. No, 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 no. Brother or sister, no, no, no. I'll sit in the middle on the hump. No, no. The trash is my job today. Don't bother getting it. What would our home look like if we followed Jesus Christ? Dad, Dad, Mom, brother, sister, friend. What would it look like? No, no, don't worry. I got the vacuum cleaner right now. I'll dust. What would our home look like if we sought 
to serve and aim low. What would our job look like? Our workplaces look like if Christians were seeking to serve? No, no, I'll, I'll take that small cubicle. But why would you do that? Because I'm seeking to serve. I'm following the example of Jesus Christ. I'm watching his attitude. I'm trying to model after my Savior. I'm trying to present my body a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service. What would our workplaces look like if we adopted, in reality, lived out what Jesus is instructing us? It would be different, wouldn't it? What would our church look like? If we weren't coming just for us, we came to serve. No, 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 no. Please don't say hi. I want to say hi first. No, 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 no. That's the lost, that's that last chalk covered donut. All right, hold on, buckle your seatbelts. No, no, it's okay. You can sit in the same seat that I've sat in for the last 55 years. <laughs> now I'm getting personal now. You're like, Pastor, get back to the Bible. We are there, aren't we? See, Mark presents us with a phenomenal thought. He says, Jesus is a supreme servant. He modeled it. He taught it. He showcased it. He demonstrated it. And he, in no greater way than his death on the cross. But Jesus Christ commands you and I to serve him and others. And if we're not, then all we're doing is magnifying ourselves. We're distorting and showcasing those things that have no business being expanded. Let's serve Jesus and let's serve others.